Hi, everyone. Hello, my name is Matteo. I'm a privacy researcher, formerly at Satis, and now at Anonos, uh, working in synthetic data. And I'm here, very happy to be here to present my work on evaluation of privacy risk in synthetic data set, work that I did in collaboration with my co-author Francisca, who is also here in the audience, and my colleague Chris and Bob Bala. So many of you are familiar with synthetic data, but just to be sure to be on the same page, uh, I will take some penguin to um, explain you what it is. So you start with the original data set. We consider for this work tabular data set. Um, there are a distribution of values for every record. And to generate a synthetic data set is rather simple conceptually. You have to learn the probability distribution of your data. Doesn't matter how, but you have to learn it. And then once you learn it, you start rolling dice and generating samples from it, and those samples constitute your synthetic data set. So this is in a nutshell how it works. Why are we here at the privacy conference uh, talking about synthetic data set? Because uh, it appears that we can um, actually, synthetic data set have uh, some advantages over traditional anonymization techniques. And in particular, the main one are two in my opinion. The first one is that synthetic data breaks the explicit one-to-one -one mapping that traditional techniques like pseudonymization always retain. And this is an Achilles heel of uh, these protection schemes because as long as this link exists, somebody smart enough will find it. The first one was Latania Sweeney, but there are a plethora of attacks that exploit this link. Uh, and the second advantage of synthetic data is that it does not need uh, to make a, an arbitrary distinction, if you want, among the attribute in your data set and divide what constitute a quasi-identifier and what instead are normal attributes. This, disting this distinction between quasi-identifier and entire concept of quasi-identifier can be dangerous because it, you restrict yourself to consider just a kind of attacks and, this, and it's also difficult because there is no way of telling what can be used by an attacker to identify what combination of variables. Um, and it's also shown that uh, you don't need many attributes to actually uniquely point to an individual in a population with high confidence. So synthetic data takes the, all the attributes in the same way um, and therefore it has, um, it has these advantages but it has also been shown uh, and we all know that per se, simply because you pass your data through a machine learning model, it doesn't mean that you have improved the privacy. Um, so in general, this is true for every anonymization technique that has to retain some utility. You always have to have a risk. There is always a risk, and the best thing that you can do is that you have to be aware of the risk and act accordingly. So this is the motivation behind our work. Um, we developed Anonymeter. Um, to be a software tool that is easy to, to use and that allow to measure privacy risk in synthetic tabular data set. Um, it's an eminently practical work. Uh, we are a synthetic data vendor. We needed something for our clients. Uh, so we also like try to give them the, num the most useful numbers and we went into the legislation and of course uh, you know that uh, Article 29 uh, Data Protection Working Group Party had uh, issued a series of opinion on anonymization in which they characterize anonymization as a technique that has to protect uh, against three kinds of risk, the singling out, the linkability, and inference risk. So those are the risks we also measure in our tool. And we, in the development of the tool, we always uh, in, involved the, the CNIL, uh, the French Data Protection Authority, um, and we are happy that uh, eventually they evaluated the tool uh, positively. So they mentioned that anonymity should be used by the data controller to assess the risk and decide whether or not they are acceptable or not. So it's important to note that anonymity doesn't tell you that the data set is anonymous. This is not our call. But what it does is that it gives you a number that in the ends of the data controller that has uh, information on the deployment and the type of data and so on and so forth can help him or her um, have a, an informed decision, so to speak. So how does it work? Uh, there are different attacks for the different type of risks, uh, but the methodology that we use to evaluate the risk is common to all of them. Uh, and it's divided in three phases, the attack phase, evaluation phase, and the risk estimation phase. In the attack phase, basically, the attacker is given access to the full synthetic data set and to uh, additional information on a set of targets that comes from the original data set. So the additional information is uh, pure, so to speak. It's not noised or uncertain. 
And then armed with these, uh, let's say, pieces of information, the attacker will generate guesses on a set of target record. And these guesses will be uh, passed on to the evaluation phase. Those guesses are either true or false. And then in the evaluation phase, we simply like compute the success rate and statistical uncertainty on the success rate. And then we pass this to the risk estimation phase, which is basically considering success rate of the attack on different population to um, separate utility from privacy, let's say, and to derive an estimate of the risk that has good properties. I'm gonna go into details of this uh, later. So before uh, talking about how we compute the risk and how we separate uh, utility from privacy, let's go quickly over the attack algorithms. Uh, so for, as, as I mentioned, every attack is uh, tasked uh, with the task of generating uh, guesses. And for singling out, these guesses uh, take the form of singling out predicates like sentences like, I believe that there is just one person in the target data set characterized by this set of attributes. Um, we have two subroutines to generate these guesses. One is looking just at rare values. It's very simple, but can be effective in spotting, for example, problem in your pre-processing. Um, and another one is uh, multivariate, so it considers up to an attribute, um, and it's basically like starting from a record and generating a query that includes this record, but potentially others. These queries are then, or candidates, so to speak, are then filtered out to select just the one that's single out in the synthetic data set. This is the, the way the synthetic data set is used. And then they are passed on to the evaluation phase. For the linkability attack, um, there are other attacks for synthetic data that measure linkability. We take a different angle in this case and we ask ourselves the question, okay, can the synthetic data be used to link together two data set that could be potentially found in the wild? So the guess in this case of the attacker is that um, he will tell you that he believes that these two partial records belong to the, to the same individual. Uh, and basically, in a nutshell, how does it work is that we assume that the synthetic data contains attributes that could be found in two or more data set, external data set. So in this case, age and earth conditions are in the data set B, so to speak, and gender and zip code are in the data set A. And basically, by matching uh, on this subspace in the synthetic data set, the adversary will try to see if these two partial records have the same, uh, let's say, nearest neighbor, the same synthetic neighbor, or the set of nearest neighbor contain the same synthetic record. And if in that case, it will tell, it will consider the, the two records to be linked. So this will be the guess of the linkability attack. Um, the inference attack is pretty standard, I think. Well, there are many instantiations of this, uh, nothing new, you basically, uh, give the attacker partial information over a record and the task to reconstruct like the value of one or more attribute. And what he will do in our case, he will go and look in the synthetic data set for the most similar, let's say, synthetic record on the subspace defined by target attribute. And then he will use the secret values from the nearest synthetic record as a guess to the, uh, as a guess for the evaluation phase. So basically, as I mentioned before, um, by doing this, these guesses of the attacker are propagated to the evaluation phase that will measure the success rate. But measuring the success rate of an attack is not enough to derive a privacy risk. For example, if you have a low success rate, it doesn't mean that there is no risk. Uh, could be that your attack is not working correctly. And also, if there is a high success rate, could it also mean that the task is simply trivial or simple. So you have to somehow distinguish this. And another one, um, so another important question is whether or not you can trust the attack that you have modeled. Um, and for this, Anonymity has built in, uh, let's say, naive attacks for every privacy risk. And these naive attacks, they basically give random guesses and they are like an internal sanity check because it could be that maybe the synthetic data set have very poor utility so it mislead it misled the attacker, or it could happen that, for example, you don't give the attacker enough auxiliary information to make an informed guess, 
So we are, we are able internal within the tool to select a way, let's say the attacker that are too weak, and then to distinguish privacy from utility, yeah, what we do, we uh, make use of a control set, so a set of record that you don't use to generate your synthetic data set. This is the only, let's say, requirement that Anonymeter pose on, on your synthetization pipeline. And this set of record comes from the same population of the original training data set, but there is no information that pass from the control data set to the synthetic data set uh, by definition. So basically, uh, measuring the success rate of the attacker against target from the control data set gives you a handle on the utility, and everything that is in excess of that, uh, we will indicate uh, like the presence of a privacy violation. So basically, we construct uh, a measure of the risk that is a normalized uh, excess of success rate using the control, the success against the control as a, as a baseline, let's say, for utility. So a um, small uh, detour into experimental results. Uh, we did uh, a few experiments in the paper. You can read for detail. But the first one is that we wanted to benchmark our tool to make sure that our, uh, to show that the way we build the risk makes sense. And to do this, we uh, created like an artificial setting in which starting from, a, let's say, a zero risk situation, we increase privacy. Uh, we add privacy leak artificially and measure the resulting risk, and we can see that um, if you give the attacker enough auxiliary information, basically the risk that you measure will actually recover the fraction of privacy risk that you have uh, introduced. Uh, so the risk measure is linear and sensitive. And finally, we also tested like several data sets synthesizing with and without DP to check what is the uh, effect of differential privacy. And we see that in general, differential privacy does indeed re reduce the risk in all cases. Um, we also observe that linkability is in general low for a uh, synthetic data set. Uh, this could confirm the intuition that it doesn't preserve the link. Um, but then, okay, I close here because I don't have uh, enough time. And in any case, this is my last slide. I mean, Anonymeter is open source uh, under permissive license. You can install it, and you're welcome to play it. We are trying to maintain it professionally. So if you find a bug, uh, file, a, file an issue. If you want to expand it, file a PR. We are happy to accept contribution. And that's it. Thanks a lot for the attention. Okay, thank you, Matteo. Uh, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, Teresa Stadler asks, how are tech records chosen? Are they chosen at random or based on worst case assumptions? That's a, good, that's a, very, good, uh, that's a very good question. So the short answer is that we chose them at random uh, because it is, in our opinion, first of all, it's easier. <laughs> and the second, uh, second thing is that it gives you like the most unbiased view on your population. For sure, an, an interesting addition of anonymeter would be, and it's really easy to do, would be to select target from subpopulation. Like anonymeter needs always, like it, it gives you a statistical measure of the risk. It cannot target a specific record. There are other methods that to evaluate the privacy of a single target. We cannot do it. We do population, so we could select subpopulation, for example, to investigate the privacy fairness trade-off. Yes, please. Um, this is a, but for now we, we pick them at random. It's very hard to, to think of a worst, worst case in general. I mean, you could argue that an outlier is a worst case, but it depends. Sometimes actually like people in the majority class are also like very vulnerable. Okay, another question in the chat from Luke Roche. They ask, um, I'm trying to understand the utility metric, but there's no clear definition in the paper or code. What does utility of 74 for the US Census mean for a social scientist? And they include a picture of table three from your yeah, paper. Yeah, no, I know what I mean. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, on the utility side, I mean, we develop a utility score that probably not, not enough details in the paper and for sure not in the code because the code is just anonymous. But basically, we computed the like uh, marginals, uh, continuous marginals. Um, then we have like a difference between the distribution for the marginals. Then there is a part of the metric that checks for correlation. Uh, and then I think we also evaluate counts query on random, like let's say, uh, subset of the data. And we merged all of these into, into one single number. Uh, so there is some thinking there. Uh, but it's, it goes from 0 to 100. So 64 is goodish. 
Okay. Um, we probably should wrap up because we're about 15 minutes. There are some more questions in the chat, so I encourage you to I look for those and for the authors to, or for the uh, questioners to find the author. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.